Good afternoon. Welcome to the MSD Symposium. Our speaker for today is a professor of Anesthesiology 12, UP Manila, Chair of the Board, Regional Anesthesia Society of the Philippines, Chair of the Board, Pain Society of the Philippines, Member, Board of Trustees, Philippine Board of Anesthesiology, Vice Chair, Philippine Board of Pain Medicine, Head, Pain Management Service, Makati Medical Center. To discuss Sugamatics and PONV, Unlikely Bedfellows, Dr. Merle De La Cruz, OD. Good afternoon, colleagues. I would like to thank the Philippine Society of Anesthesiologists and the Merck Sharp and Dome uh, for inviting me to speak to you this afternoon. I chose this intriguing title because the association came as a surprise to me and I think it would be to you too. So it is going to be a, an enjoyable afternoon for you and as well as for me. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm a member of the ad board of the MSD and a member of the ad board of Marina Philippines. Uh, Post-operative nausea and vomiting continues to be a burden to patients, medical staff, and the healthcare facilities. The incidence, which is fairly recent, has been found to be 30% in the general population, 80% in high-risk high cohorts, and uh, it leads to significant patient dissatisfaction. Sometimes patient even rates POMV worse, a worse problem after surgery than post-operative pain. It can also lead to longer stay in the PACU, unanticipated hospital admission of ambulatory patients, as well as increasing health costs. I tried to find out the mechanism for post-operative nausea and vomiting, and uh, I found this statement from Horn, uh, which was published in 2014. It was a review on the pathophysiology and mechanisms of post-operative nausea and vomiting, and he said, there is still a lack of fundamental knowledge of the mechanisms that drive the hindbrain central pattern generator and the forebrain pathways that produce postoperative nausea and vomiting. Well, he said that uh, the uh, postoperative nausea and vomiting can be caused by uh, several stimuli, but he said that from the beginning, the use of general anesthesia. Uh, since the 1840s was recognized to cause nausea and vomiting and are very common side effects of surgical recovery. And he plays as the stimulus number one, the role of volatile anesthetics and opioids. If you will look at this diagram, uh, this is surgery here, this black spot. And during surgery, inhalational anesthetic may have been used and intravenous opioids. And if you can see, the intensity of nausea and vomiting is very high immediately post-op because of the effect of the inhalational anesthetic. This effect on the intensity actually uh, tapers down after the surgery uh, in the first, second, or third day. But then because of the use of opioids and the uh, contribution of altered GI motility, if, uh, if uh, opioids is used um, because of the effect on GI motility and of course the inflammatory mediators, which are produced by the surgery itself. The uh, intensity of POMV actually does not go down very quickly and remains for a while in the post-discharge, as post-discharge nausea and vomiting. Then we go to the next stimulus, which is uh, uh, the surgical trauma and inflammation. And uh, Horn suggested that uh, this, uh, stimulus is actually related to the increase in the duration of surgery, to the types of surgery, specifically cholecystectomy and gyne gynecological surgery, as well as ear, nose, and throat, throat surgery. But also, if the surgery is laparoscopic, uh, of course, you are familiar with uh, the uh, techniques that are used for laparoscopic surgery. It can also be associated with GI inflammatory response, secondary to surgical trauma or manipulation. There's also a relationship between post-operative ill use, which follows surgery and intestinal inflammation. And it actually, uh, antiemetics have been found to be also, to have anti-inflammatory effect 
like dexamethasone, the 5-HT3 uh, antagonist, the NKY antagonist. So the anti-inflammatory effect relates uh, the uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting to surgical trauma and inflammation. Then the third one is the uh, neural pathways and the neuropharmacological targets associated with the neural pathways. In the left side of the diagram, you will see here the GI tract and uh, uh, what is acting on, uh, what is sending the signal from the GI tract are the vagal afferent fibers that connects with the nu nucleus tractus solitarius and the area postrina. You will look at the right side of the, of the diagram here, you will see the neuropharmacological targets. First, you have the vagal afferent fibers, which can target the NTS and the area postrina, inhalational anesthetics as well, opioids. And I just would like to call your attention to the vestibular nucleus up here. It also sends uh, uh, stimulus to the nucleus tractus solitarius. And I place here the blood-brain barrier. Why? Because the blood-brain barrier pre prevents cr the, the crossing of hydrophilic substances, but is the, the, the crossing of lipophilic substances is enhanced by, uh, so the lipophilic substances like lipophilic opiates can cross very easily because of the transmission through the blood-brain barrier. And the fourth uh, is the anti-emetic role now of opioids. Opioid analgesics have opposing dose-dependent effects on nausea and vomiting. At low doses, morphine and opioid receptor agonists produce emesis, low doses. At higher doses, it inhibits emesis, so it's actually contrary. Uh, usually, it is dose-dependent. The higher doses you have, you're going to have more nausea and vomiting, but with morphine, it is in reverse. Low doses, nausea and vomiting, higher doses, it inhibits nausea and vomiting. And the dual effects of opioids and emesis are the result of separately loco located new receptors outside and within the blood-brain barrier, where the era postrema and, the potential, and potentially the NTS are located. The NTS is located within the blood-brain barrier, and the area postrema is outside the blood-brain barrier. They all, they're all also thinking that maybe there are su the subtypes of the uh, opioid receptors, the mu1 and mu2, negate the emetic and the anti-emetic effects of morphine. Of course, there are genetic variants of the opioid gene. Now, I would like now to go into the fourth consensus guidelines for the management of post-operative nausea and vomiting. This is a very important guideline that came out recently, 2020, in the... Uh, Anesthesia Analgesia Journal. I find this very important because the optimal management of PONV is complex. At the level of drugs, variations in pharmacokinetics, efficacy and side effects can vary, and the choice has to be related to the clinical context. Additionally, prophylaxis use will also vary according to the adverse effects. On the institutional level, the management of PONV is subject to the different, con different or a few considerations. Uh, the cost effectiveness of the drug, the availability of the drug in the institution, as well as the presence of the drug in the drug formulary. So there are many things to consider when you are managing PONV. This is study uh, by uh, Tongan and associates and colleagues uh, had previous iterations, uh, three, in fact, one in 2003, 2009, 2014, before this guideline, which came out in the ANA in 2020. The guideline aims to provide a comprehensive evidence-based clinical recommendations on the management of PONV in adults and children. The last systematic literature search leading to this publication identified over 9,000 published studies and the establishment of the Enhanced Recovery Pathways, or ERAS, locally, has led to a significant paradigm shift in the approaches in perioperative care, and findings on the subject are incorporated in these guidelines. As a matter of fact, I think it is guideline number seven. So what are the goals of these current guidelines, the 2020 guidelines, or the fourth edition? To identify the risks 
uh, in uh, PONV in adults and children, establish the interventions and to reduce the baseline risks, assess the ind individual or combination therapies for prophylaxis, including non-pharmacological uh, uh, treatments, a certain efficacy treatment with or without prior prophylaxis, determine the optimal dosing and timing of anti-emetic prophylaxis, appraise the cost-effectiveness of PONV management strategies, create an algorithm to summarize risk stratification, risk reduction, prophylaxis, and treatment of PONV, and evaluate the management of PONV within the enhanced recovery processes. And last, propose a research agenda for future studies. Uh, this is the way they actually um, grade evidence that is used in this guideline. And it is similar to the system used in the acute pain management practice guideline reported by the American Society of Anesthesiologists in 2012. If you will look here, category A, uh, they're looking at supported uh, literature. So it will involve randomized controlled trials report, statistically significant differences between clinical interventions for a specified, specified clinical outcome. And le level one is when the literature contains multiple randomized controlled trials and aggregated findings are supported by meta-analysis. Level two, category A, level two, the literature contains multiple randomized control trials, but the number of studies is insufficient to conduct a viable meta-analysis for the purpose of these guidelines. So, and so on, and so on. So actually the evidence actually loses its strength as it goes down from level one to level three, and then as it goes down from level B all the way, level B, uh, category B, level three, okay? because you will find these levels as we go on and as I, as I cite literature. So guideline number one, identify patient risk for PONV. This diagram here tells you uh, the initial simple diagram, simple uh, recommendation of risk that was given by Appel many years ago, which only had four risk factors for PONV in adults. This now is expanded. And so we have here, to the right now, uh, positive overall uh, risk factors. The female sex, which is B1 evidence. The history of PONV or motion, sick, motion sickness, again B1. Non-smoking, younger age, general versus regional anesthesia. Uh, the evidence is A1. The use of volatile anesthetics and nitrous oxide, again A1. Post-operative opioids, A1. Duration of anesthesia, B1, and type of surgery like cholecystectomy, laparoscopic, gynecological, and ENT, B1. Okay, so I will not go further down. These are actually the more important studies, the more important risk factors that have been identified. So let's look at the anesthetic risk factors. For the volatile anesthetics, it is dose dependent. So the higher the concentration they use and the longer the volatile anesthetics are used, the higher the incidence or the risks of PONV. Particularly prominent is in the first two to six hours following surgery. The nitrous oxide risk is duration dependent. If it is less than one hour, the numbers needed to treat is 128 PONVs. Now, as you go higher, let's say greater than two hours, the numbers needed to treat goes down to nine, meaning that uh, you have nine patients before you see one patient who's going to have PONV. In comparison to you have, if, if, if it's less than one hour, you, have, you need to have 128 patients before you have one that you need to treat with PONV. And then you have post-operative opioids. It, again, it is dose dependent, similar to volatile anesthetics. And the effect lasts as long as the opioids are used. So let us look at patient risk assessment for PONV. Risk factors should be used for risk assessment and to guide PONV management. We have named the risk factors in the previous slides. The use of risk factors to guide management has been challenged and more liberal administration of PONV prophylaxis has been proposed, meaning 
that because the uh, POND risk factors are not consistent in uh, their prediction of POND, some studies have actually suggested that POND prophylaxis can be given in a more liberal way, meaning less risk factors, you already need to give prophylaxis for POND. The National Clinical Outcomes Registry and the, quality, the American Quality Institute created customized data on anti-emetic prophylaxis, which has been evaluated and utilized as a marker of anesthesia quality and a measure of disparity in treatment. Their study have shown that more patients uh, are given only single antiemetics, like for example, uh, dexamethasone and ondansetron. Uh, more patients are given single antiemetics than combination of two of the two antiemetics. This is what they found out in one of the studies that they have conducted. Now, risk scores. POND risk scores have been shown to reduce the rate of POND at an institutional level and can be used to inform and guide therapy. We'll go through risk scores in a short while. This is commonly used uh, are the APFEL and the COIVORANTA score. The COIVORANTA score only added to the APFEL the greater than 60 minutes duration of surgery. It has also been suggested that one or two antiemetics should be administered to all patients since risk scores are not completely predictive, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Risk scores represent an objective approach to predict the incidence of POND or post-discharge nausea and vomiting with sensitivity and specificity of between 65 and 70 percent. So this is the upfell score now. There are only four the female gender, non-smoker, the history of POND or motion sickness, and post-operative opioids. They have graded the number of risk factors and uh, uh, plotted it with the percent, uh, the percent uh, of possibility of POND, which is if it is if there is one score, one risk factor that is present, POND can occur in twenty percent. Two score two risk factors, sorry, 40%, three risk factors, 60%, and 80% if there are four risk factors. Similarly, for post-discharge nausea and vomiting, they conducted a study of 2,170 US outpatients, and they had found out that the incidence of post-discharge nausea and vomiting was 37% on the first 48 hours after discharge, and identified five predictors. Again, the female de gender, the history of POND, age of less than 50 now, and then the use of opioids in the PACU and nausea in the PACU. And then they graded this again. Zero, if there's no risk factor, then there, there's no incidence of POND. But the incidence goes up if there's one risk factor, to approximately 20%, two risk factors to uh, 35 or 30% three risk factors to 45% and so on, 80% for five risk factors. If we go back to, if we go back to the Apfel score, uh, I just would like to tell you that they have graded uh, zero to one as low risk, two as medium risk, and two above, three and above as uh, uh, high risks. Now let's go to uh, the risk factors uh, for post-operative uh, vomiting and nausea and vomiting in children. The risk factors for children is surgery of greater or equal to 30 minutes, age greater or equal to three years, is trabismus surgery or surgery in the eyes, and the history of post-operative vomiting or uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting in the family. And again, the total number of points is four. And these are the uh, grading of the risk factors. Uh, if there are four risk factors present, 80%, there's 80% chance of post-operative nausea and vomiting in children. So let's go to guideline number two, which is to reduce the baseline risk for POMV. There are strategies that can do this. First, avoidance of general anesthesia and use of regional anesthesia, more use of regional anesthesia. Use of propofol for induction and maintenance of anesthesia. 
Avoidance of nitrous oxide in surgeries lasting over one hour. Avoidance of volatile anesthetic. Minimization of intraoperative and postoperative opioids. Adequate hydration. And using Sogamadex instead of Neustigmine for the reversal of neuromuscular blockade. This last entry has been, was not in the previous three editions of the guidelines. It came out on, the last, on this uh, last one that came out in 2020. So let's look at using Sogamadex instead of Neustigmine for the reversal of neuromuscular blockade. The guideline used the uh, systematic review and meta-analysis of Ristovska, which is looked at the efficacy and safety of Sogamadex against Neustigmine and reversing neuromuscular blockade in adults as, as, as its primary outcome but also looked at the adverse events associated with the use of both traversal agents. So the main results, well, there were 41 studies involving 4,206 participants that were included. There were 38 new studies that were, that were used, 12 eligible for meta-analysis of primary outcome, meaning the reversal of neuromuscular block, and 28 were eligible for meta-analysis of secondary outcomes, which were the adverse effect, which involved 2,298 patients. For the primary outcome, Sugamadex, 2 milligrams per kilogram, reversed T2 block 6.6 .6 times faster than the Eustigmine, 50 micrograms per kilogram. And so gamma dex for milligrams per kilogram reverse post tetanic count of one to five block 16.8 times faster than neustigmine 70 micrograms per kilogram. Then for the secondary outcome, there are significantly fewer composite adverse events with sugamma dex group 16% compared with the neustigmine group 28%. And on specific events, there was significantly less bradycardia from 11 studies and less PONV from six studies. Less signs of postoperative residual paralysis in 15 studies also was seen in the Sugamadex group compared to the Neustigmine group. I looked for other studies that came out after the 2020 guidelines, and I found this, the study, this was, I was healthy in my, research, uh, in my literature search, uh, but this was found, and it was the study of Herford. Uh, the primary outcomes that he was looking for was time to recovery of the train of four ratio to greater than 0.9, total anesthesia time, time from admission until patient was ready for discharge from the post anesthetic care unit, the occurrence of bradycardia, and the occurrence of post operative nausea and vomiting. And there were 111 clinical trials that were found, and meta analysis was done on 32 studies. This is a forest plot of the studies that were looked at by Herford. And this looked at the incidence of post-operative nausea and vomiting associated with reversal with either Sogamadex or Neustigmine. And if this is the middle line here, you will note that more of the studies tend to favor Sogamadex than Neustigmine, meaning that there were less post-operative nausea and vomiting when Sugamadex was used for reversal. This is what is being shown here by the forest plot that found Neustigmine to have lesser PONB compared to Sugamadex. Then another study, this was done by, in Korea by Young Ho Kim, which was a comparison of the effects of Sugamadex, Neustigmine, and Peridostigmine on post-operative nausea and vomiting. They use a propensity mass study of five much study of five hospitals. So there were adults. They they actually used adults greater than 18 years who received general anesthesia from January 2014 to December 2019 from five hospitals. They matched 7,793 Sugamadex patients with 7,793 Eustigmine patients meaning on whom Sugamadex or Neustigmine were used, they matched. And then 10,197 Sugamadex patients were matched with 10,197 Peridostigmine patients. And again, 19,377 Neustigmine patients were matched with 19,377 Peridostigmine patients. So these are all matched. And the results were the odds ratio for PONV was low in the Sugamadex group. And 
this was significant. Peridostigmine uh, compared to the neostigmine group also had low uh, odds ratio, and this was significant. There was no difference between sogamadex and peridostigmine, and their conclusion was sogamadex and peridostigmine may lower the incidence of POND compared to the neostigmine in patients undergoing general anesthesia. So I, I flashed this um, slide again. Uh, these are strategies to reduce baseline risk. Just to remind you, I just want to, to repeat this. Avoidance of GA will reduce baseline risk. Use of regional anesthesia will be preferred and will reduce baseline risk. Use of propofol for induction and maintenance of anesthesia will reduce baseline risk. Avoidance of nitrous oxide, uh, especially using it less than one hour. You avoid it if it is greater than one hour. Avoidance of volatile anesthetics, minimization of intraoperative and postoperative opioids, adequate hydration, and using sugamadex instead of neustigmine for the reversal of neuromuscular block. So multimodal systemic analgesia can actually reduce the incidence of POMV. Let's just look at these different uh, drugs. Let's look at acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, prophylactic IV acetaminophen, as part of multimodal analgesic regimen, reduces nausea if given before the onset of pain. After a gastrectomy, IV acetaminophen, in addition to continuous epidural analgesia, showed decreased opioid use. So meaning, if you use this analgesic, opioid use is reduced, and this is going to significantly reduce POMV. Oral acetaminophen has also been shown to reduce opioid requirement, again, the use of opioid and considerably less costly. So its effect on PNB has not been well studied, but it's expected to reduce the use of opioid and therefore to reduce uh, PONB. The use of NSAIDs now and ketamine. Randomized controlled trials and meta-analysis show that perioperative, perioperative NSAIDs and cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors uh, and less so intraoperative ketamine may have a morphine sparing effect and therefore reduction in postoperative nausea and vomiting. There are data to suggest that non-selective NSAIDs are associated with anastomotic leak, however. So this is actually a condition that uh, uh, will prevent uh, more people from using NSAIDs for multimodal analgesia. Very operative alpha-2 agonists uh, like clonidine and dexmedetomidine administration decrease opioid consumption and PONV. After lap laparoscopic cholecystectomy, dexmedetomidine, uh, one milligram per kilogram before skin incision, reduce the incidence of PONV, similar to dexamethasone, eight milligrams, and prove superior in lowering post-operative pain during the first 24 hours. Pain and PONV benefits were confirmed with dexmedetomidine when it was added with ibuprofenil and on Dancitron PCA after thoracotomy. More on alpha-2 agonists, prophylactic dexmedetomidine reduced post-operative pain at one hour and post-operative days one to three and resulted in faster return to daily activities. However, there was no difference uh, in the, in the uh, uh, incidence of PONB and use of antiemetics. Interoperative infusion of esmolol, which is a beta antagonist, uh, have been shown to reduce PACI opioid requirement as well as the risk of PONB. Neurational anesthesia, well, meta analysis showed epidural anesthesia significantly decreases PONV. For gynecological surgery, epidural, epidural anesthesia administration may need to be continued after surgery for this to reduce PONV. After open colorectal cancer surgery, thoracic epidural uh, results in better pain control, less IV morphine, and less PONV. Bilateral tap block uh, decreases postoperative opioid use and PONV. And for colorectal surgery, thoracic epidural tap, and the tap blocks uh, actually compared to thoracic epidural uh, allowed for a shorter length of stay without a difference in POMV. For regional anesthesia now, for colorectal surgery, um, 
Well, in general, regional anesthesia, I, I don't like to go through all of this now, but in general, uh, regional anesthesia for colorectal surgery and for other surgeries tend to reduce the use of opioids and tend to reduce the incidence of POMV. Now, this last study out here, the review of 18 studies that compared POMV outcomes between regional anesthesia containing enhanced recovery programs and non-regional anesthesia containing care pathways, they have found out that five uh, uh, found the R8 to have improved PNV. One found PNV to be higher in the RA group and under spinal anesthesia, and 12 found no difference. Okay, so it's still, um, well, the spread does not actually favor really strongly the use of regional anesthesia because 12 found no difference. Propofol and Tiva, well, systematic review and meta-analysis of RCT showed that the PONV risk with Propofol Tiva is comparable to volatile, volatile anesthetics plus single agent prophylaxis. Uh, so meaning uh, if you have volatile anesthetic and you have prophylaxis uh, anti-emetic, it is comparable to the use of Propofol. And when used in combination with other prophylactic agents, Propofol Tiva further reduces the risk of PNV. Then this one, subhypnotic sub doses of Propofol infusion in combination with an anti-emetic also significantly reduces the, um, the incidence of POMV. Supplemental oxygen was suggested uh, to be associated uh, with the change in the POMV, but uh, it seems that uh, it only reduces um, early vomiting after abdominal surgery. The well interventions, now we go to uh, the use of uh, Sogamadex compared to the new stigmine in traversing uh, neuromuscular block at the neuromuscular junction. They had found out that uh, using Sogamadex lowers the POMV risks and the NNP is 16. Uh, they also looked at uh, the use of lidocaine infusion, but they had found out that there was no benefit seen in other surgery types. They have only seen this in abdominal procedures. Now let's look at children. Uh, TIVA would reduce baseline risk. Liberal fluid, uh, like the use of lactated bringers, 30 milliliters against 10 milliliters per kilogram can reduce the risk of POMV. Opioid sparing techniques can also reduce POMV. So caudal blocks with or without systemic dexamethasone reduces POMV. Other reg regional techniques like tap blocks also reduces POMV. IV lidocaine for tonsillectomies reduces uh, POMV because tonsillectomies have a very high incidence of POMV among children. Ato agonists, alpha-2 agonists, like intranasal dexmetidomitin and oral clonidine can also reduce POMV as well as the use of acetaminophen. Let's go to guideline number three. This is prophylaxis using three interventions in adults at risk of POMV. This is the guideline number three. So if there is um, the risk for POMV, administer POMV prophylaxis using three interventions. In this iteration of the POMV guideline, one of the major changes is that they now recommend the use of multimodal prophylaxis in patients with one or more risk factors. So let's look at the summary of proposed adult POMV guideline. These are the risk factors up here. So this is actually an infographics, right? So you have female sex, younger age, non-smoker, the surgery type, uh, if it is cholecystectomy, gynecological or laparoscopic, the history of POMV or motion sickness, and opioid analgesics. These are the risk five factors. And you can minimize the risk factors by minimizing the use of nitrous oxide, of volatile anesthetics and high doses of neustigmine, considering regional anesthesia as the anesthetic technique and opioid sparing management like multimodal analgesia uh, to reduce the use of opioids because opioids generally is associated with POMD and uh, the utilization of enhanced recovery pathways, which actually uh, generally opioid spares. 
So the risk is stratification now. So the quantity, quantify the number of risk factors to determine risk and guide antiemetic therapy, okay? If there are one to two risks, one to two risk factors from here, give two agents. If there are greater than three to two, the greater than two to two risk factors, give three to four agents. And uh, these are the agents for prophylaxis. You have the five HT3 receptor antagonists. You have the corticosteroids. You have the antihistamines. You have the dopamine antagonists. You have the propofol, anesthesia, the NK1 receptor antagonists, acupuncture, and anticholinergics. So if there are one to two factors, you give two agents from any one of these groups, but you do not give two from the 5-AC receptor antagonists. You get only one and then mix it, let's say, with corticosteroids, something like this. Now, if there are greater than two risk factors, you have to give three to four agents. So you can give 5 ht 3 receptor antagonists or, and a corticosteroid, plus let's say, uh, let's see, an NK1 receptor antagonist, something like that. And then rescue treatment must be given immediately as soon as the symptom arises. And another, another thing, to, another note, you use an antiemetic of the different class than the prophylactic drugs that were given. Let's say you gave 5-HT3 receptor antagonist and a corticosteroid, and the patient develops uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting after the surgery. You choose another, another, prophylactic, another drug from another group, let's say a dopamine antagonist. You no, you no longer choose from these two groups here. And these are the anti-emetic doses and timing for prevention of PUNV in adults. And uh, these are the evidences. We'll not go into this. This is actually a very long slide to discuss. So I just want to, to go to, to um, list with you or review with you the 5-HT3 um, anti-emetics. Ondansetron is the gold standard. Okay, the Lositron is a highly specific and selective 5-HT3, uh, but it produces QT prolongation. Granicitron is, has similar PONB antagonism as the others and comparable to eight milligrams of dexamethasone. Tropicitron is competitive and selective, used for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Remocitron is second generation available in Japan and Southeast Asia. And last, I think Polonocitron is actually a second generation, 40 hour half life. Uh, and it is actually preferred now if you want to have antiemetic, antiemesis for several days. It's more effective than other 5 ht 3 inhibitor, NK1 inhibitor, and dexamethasone. So, Ondansitron is the gold standard. And now I think the preferred 5 ht 3 is Polonocitron. These are the NK1 receptors. A crepitant has four hour half life and effective orally and IV. Cazopitant is not approved. Rolopitant is long acting, 180 hours half life, but again, not approved. And vestipitant is used after ondacitron has failed. Corticosteroid, well, th this is a, a very popular and has been used for a long time. Best is given pre induction may have top-up doses for long procedures, does not seem to affect wound healing and bleeding, as well as increase in blood sugar and diabetes. No increase in side effects with increased dose, and it reduces pain as well because of the inflammatory, anti-inflammatory effect. Other corticosteroids, the methylprednisolone prevents PONV and pain. Uh, Betamethasone only has a small PONV preventive effect compared to placebo. I just I didn't I was not able to write here. Dexamethasone is as uh, has actually a A1 A1 evidence in terms of reducing or preventing PONB. The antidopaminergics. Amisulfide. It is a dopamine receptor D1 D3 antagonist. It is an antipsychotic drug and effective in established PONB. Can be used prior to uh, can be used after prior dose of antiemetic uh, has failed and associated with sedation, except for pyramidal side effects and QTC prolongation. Propelidol 
Lower doses is antiemetic and only causes transient prolongation of the QTC. A dose of 0 0.625 milligrams is recommended. Haloperidol, antiemetic use is not approved by the FDA. And metoclopramide, prevention of PUND, has an NNT of 8 to 10, not effective when used in combination. Higher doses significantly prevented PUND. Uh, NNT was 16.9 and 11.6 for 25 and 50 milligram doses, but it can produce extrapyramidal symptoms with higher doses compared to the 10 milligram dose that you're familiar with. Perfenacine is a typical antipsychotic and antidopaminergic drug. Now, the antihistamines, dimenhydrinate is effective comparable to placebo with NNT of 8 and five in early or late post-operative period. Diphenhydramine, or um, very familiar, 50 milligram effective compared, 50 milligram is effective compared to placebo, and the quality of recovery is not different. Promethacine, 12.5 or 25 milligrams alone is effective, also effective with other antiemetics. That's a black box, box warning. It can cause damage and gangrene to surrounding tissues if it goes out of vein. So make sure that there is a well-running IV and concentration should not be greater than 25 milligrams and rate of injection should be 25 milligrams per minute. It may be given for deep IM for 25 milligrams. Scopolamine transdermal is effective. Onset is four hours and best given before surgery at the, or the night before. The NNT is six. Other antiemetics are the gabapentinoids. Gabapentin, 600 to 800 milligrams, has been shown to decrease POND when given one to two hours before surgery. Midazolam can decrease POND when given before or 30 minutes after surgery. Two milligrams is effective, effective compared with ondansetron in efficacy. May be given in combination with other antiemetics. Ephedrine is effective at 0.5 milligrams per kilogram IM and found not to increase BP and heart rate. It is comparable to droperidol in effect. Now let's go to the very interesting non-pharmacological -pharma prophylaxis. The use of acupuncture uh, for uh, PC6 point compares fairly with anti other antiemetics. It may be given before and after surgery. Monitoring of neuromuscular function of the median nerve during surgery is also effective in POND management, especially if stimulus is tetanic. Fluids, adequate hydration can minimize um, a PONV or prevent PONV. And uh, this minimizes uh, the uh, guidelines by errors like minimizing fasting time is also effective in the prevention of PONV. Carbohydrate loading has no impact on PONV. This is one guideline of the errors. Aromatherapy did not reduce PONV. Ginger, no reduction in PONB, but a small reduction in nausea. Supplemental oxygen, a meta-analysis found that high inspired oxygen concentration not found to reduce PNB, but had a weak effect on late nausea. Chewing gum. Chewing gum is showing promise. The effect, the evidence is A3 for the treatment of PONB with one small pilot study suggesting that chewing gum was not inferior to andansetron for the treatment of PND in female patients who underwent laparoscopic or breast surgery under general anesthesia. It is a very easy non-pharmacologic prophylaxis to use and is something that your patients may enjoy. It's something that you might like to try. The others, healing touch, touch and music were not found to be effective prophylactic against prophylaxis against PUND, but it is a good prophylaxis against pain. Morinda was found to be effective in reducing the incidence of early nausea when used in the dose of 600 milligrams. Administration of low-dose naloxone reduces post-operative nausea and the need for rescue antiemetics. These are the pharmacologic combination therapy for adults and children. We are not going to go into this in detail now. So guideline number four, Administer prophylactic antiemetic therapy to children at increased risk for POV, PONV. As in adults, use of combination therapy is most effective. So let's go through this infographics again. Preoperative risk factors are age of greater than three years old, history of POV and PONV, motion sickness, okay, 
from or motion sickness, history of POV and POMV in the previous surgery, and motion sickness, family history of POV, POMV, and postpubertal female. So child greater than three years and postpubertal pubertal female. The intraoperative risk factors are intrabismal surgery, adenotonsillectomy, autoplasty, and surgery greater than 30 minutes, use of volatile anesthetics, anticholinergics, and positive are long-acting opioids. Of course, the use of opioids, even if they are not long-acting, intraoperatively and postoperatively. And here is the risk stratification. Uh, no risks, low risk, no risk. One to two risk factors are medium risk and greater than three risk factors is high risk. If it is low risk, none or uh, five HT3 antagonists or dexamethasone. You also, uh, it's suggested that you give antiemetics. But if it is one to two risk factors, then it's medium risks. So you can give a combination of two anti anti-emetics. Uh, if it's high risk, you give a 5-HC3 antagonist plus dexamethasone and consider TIVA. And for rescue treatment, use anti-emetic from different class than prophylactic drug like preperidol, promethacine, dimenhydrinate, metoclopramide, and may also consider acupuncture or acupressure. This is for children. So just a few words for propofol. Systematic reviews support the use of propofol PIVA as an intervention for reducing baseline risk of POMB in children undergoing strabismal surgery. Ocular cardiac reflex occur often though. So you have to look out for ocular cardiac reflex. This is for surgery for strabismus because they pull up the muscles. NK1 receptor antagonists, RCT compared three doses of prepitant uh, compared to IV on Dancitron and they found comparable uh, results in the prevention of POMV, prevention and treatment of POMV. 5-HT3 receptor antagonists. Now, many studies in the literature on effectivity. This is actually very well used, especially on Dancitron, very well studied, especially on Dancitron. Most recognizable is on Dancitron, and Palonocitron seem a better drug because of its longer half life. Prophylactic antiemetics in children, dexamethasone and combination therapy. Uh, we mentioned that already. And non-pharmacologic therapy can include uh, acupuncture at the PC6 acupuncture point. And this has been uh, compared to ondansetron and found to have no, no difference in, uh, preventing, in preventing PONB, uh, PONB post-operative post nausea and vomiting, meaning acupuncture and ondansetron have similar uh, prevention of PONB. These are antiemetic doses for prophylaxis of POV, POMV in children. So now we go to guideline number five, provide antiemetic treatment for patients with POMV who did not receive prophylaxis or when prophylaxis failed. So 5-HT3 remains the first line. Haloperidol is comparable with ondansetron except it has more sedation. NK1 receptor antagonist is comparable to ondansetron. Propofol is effective but must be used with caution because uh, it can really cause uh, a lot of side effects if it is given uh, rapidly. It must be used uh, very, very low doses. Combination therapy for established POMB may be a better option uh, on Dancitron plus the Peridol plus Dexamethasone. And other therapies, aromatherapy, ginger, and acupuncture may be used, although we have found out that Aromatherapy and ginger actually do not have very, very good effect, except for nausea. Evaluate for other causes of POMV if uh, there is actually a failure of anti-emetic treatment or anti-emetic prophylaxis. Post-discharge nausea and vomiting now. 17% of patients experience nausea and 8% experience vomiting. So TIVA and volatile anesthesia were comparable, associated with uh, post-discharge nausea and vomiting. The current evidence supports the use of multimodal antiemetics for the prevention of post-discharge nausea and vomiting. And combination therapy was associated with significantly lower PD, PDNV. For example, the combination of andansetron, aprepitant, haloperidol, or dexamethasone. 
And guideline number six ensure general multimodal POMV prevention and timely rescue treatment is implemented in the clinical setting. So let's look first at the advantages of implementation of POMV. First, it minimizes moderate to high risk patients who receive prophylaxis, minimize moderate to high risk patients uh, who receive suboptimal prophylaxis, minimizes the risk that low risk patients receive ineffective single treatment, and general adoption of multimodal prevention strategies may facilitate general implementation of the POMV guidelines. So let's look at the barriers now. I think this is more important to discuss. While risk adapted protocols are more cost effective and will likely lead to better patient outcomes when implemented, management take into account many, many factors, one of which is patient choice, cost effectiveness, and patient's pre existing conditions. Other factors are resistance to change. Usually, uh, when there is uh, a protocol that is actually recommended and this needs change in the usual way that we practice, most people would resist this first. And I have heard many times the statement that why should I change? I haven't had any problems with the one that I'm using. So they would not look at the other findings or the evidence that has come out in literature. Of course, acquisition costs of antiemetics might not be uh, acceptable to the institution and potential for adverse effects have to be considered. And uh, sometimes it is necessary, especially in the United States, for the institution of merit-based incentive payment system, meaning that uh, if uh, they have, they, they put points to merit and the payments uh, of let's say Medicare uh, is actually uh, based on uh, the merits that the uh, institution has, the number of merit points I think that the institution has. This is in the United States. And now guideline number seven, administer Multimodal prophylactic antiemetics in enhanced recovery pathways or ERAs. So, in 2016, the American Society of Enhanced Recovery released the expert opinion statement, uh, which said that all patients should receive POMV prophylaxis during the perioperative period. The number of medications used for treatment and prophylaxis should be determined by the number of modifiable and non modifiable risk factors and medications used should represent different mechanisms of action in an attempt to achieve multimodal benefit. And the panel of the, the panel that is actually the, the authors of the guidelines agrees with these statements of the um, ERPs uh, or ERAs. So POMB, man, POMB management strategies for ERP is similar to risk management prophylaxis and treatment of POMB guidelines. So it's similar, okay? Interventions which reduce the baseline emetogenic risk factors. Uh, ERP patients should receive at least two agents for POMB prophylaxis. Treatment of established POMB should be prompt and, aggress and aggressive and should not be of the same group of agents as the ones that were used for prophylaxis. And for each surgery type, the emetogenicity of the procedure, availability of effective regional anesthesia technique, and expected course of post-operative recovery should be considered to optimize the management of POMD. Now, the POMD management strategies implemented in the published ERPs are largely similar to the principle of risk reduction, again, prophylaxis and treatment that is discussed in this guideline. So to continue, use of multi-model uh, pain management or multimodal, multimodal uh, baseline risk assessment of patients, use of paravertebral block and pectoral nerve blocks for breast surgery, multimodal analgesia and opioid sparing strategies, the gynecologic oncologic surgery uh, utilizing multimodal POMB prophylaxis, for cesarean delivery, multimodal POMB prevention. And similar guidelines are observed for radical cystectomies, cardiac surgery, laryngeal surgery, and multi-level spinal surgery. So that's the end of the lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was hurrying. I thought I did not have enough time. Thank you, Dr. Odie, and see you at the open forum.